Christmas. And let's see. Um, yes, and we are live. That's great. So welcome everyone to Climate Chat. I'm your host, Dan Miller. And today we are going to be talking about Jim Hansen's latest white paper uh, about hope versus hopium, about global warming acceleration. Now this paper, this, this white paper, so it's not like a fully peer-reviewed paper. It's more like a I wouldn't call it a newsletter, but but it's something he's sending out uh, without the formal um, review process because it's about a peer-reviewed paper that he published late last year called Global Warming in the Pipeline. And in a way, this is an update to that, saying what, you know, since they know about, um, uh, they have more, more evidence about that paper. So, um, so... That's what this is about. It's really interesting. This is some of the most important information about climate change that is out there right now. This is something that's going to affect everyone's lives uh, because this is this is kind of like the real deal. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing that and see if I can switch over to the that one. And... Um, Okay, get back to Zoom and to share. And okay, here I will share this. So this is um, what the newsletter looks like. And by the way, there are links in the description on both YouTube and Clubhouse linking to all of these uh, uh, papers, both uh, this one called Global Warming Acceleration, Hope versus Opium as well as the Global Warming in the Pipeline original peer-reviewed paper. Um, I also did uh, a Twitter summary of the Hope versus Hopium a few day, a couple days ago, which already has a lot of views. And it just really breaks down like the essence of the paper in like 20 short tweets. And so if you don't want to read the four pages, which we're going to go through today, uh, you can just get a quick glimpse uh, that way as well. So... Um, First of all, just, just for the few that might not know what hopium is, hopium is a sort of a combination between hope and opium. And the idea is that if you're smoking hopium, uh, you, you have too much of an optimistic view of what's happening. And you're sort of deluding yourself um, with, uh, with that. And that's uh, why he uses that the phrase I, hopium. And Dan, I'd, I'd also say it's not just an optimistic view of well, I guess it, it's the whole what is happening and what in the in the atmosphere, you know, like sort of overlooking the fact of what's locked in and then also what can happen even if we stopped everything. Um, well, it's uh, well, that's, yeah, uh, yeah he's hopeful. saying that there's certain things happening and some people, well, you'll see, he's talking, when he talks about hopium, he's talking about the net zero policies of world governments who are ignoring what's happening now, not taking action right now and putting it off to the future saying, hey, we'll have net zero in 2050 and everything will be fine. And that he is saying is definitely hopium. That's your, you know, you're deluding yourself. It's wishful thinking. And we'll, we're going to get back to that as he, as he talks about it more in the paper. So um, this, the top two images are simply maps of the world showing temperature anomaly or the temperature trend. And the first one on the left is 1970 to 2010. And you see it's warmer in the Arctic, that's Arctic amplification. You can see the whole world's kind of warming up here a lot in Asia, Europe and at the top of Africa. But then when you move to 2010 to 2023, 20, uh, you see it's much different and much warmer and uh, you can see across the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, it's warm. This is very important because this, this ties into the global warming pipeline. So there's something going on. You'll also see uh, relative to 1970 to 2010, a cooling trend 
around uh, Greenland, which is very interesting. And this is uh, likely due to the AMOC uh, sh slowing down. And we've talked a lot about the AMOC here. And uh, anyway, we're going to be looking at some other uh, graphs in here. This is just the top one, is just sort of to get your attention here. And I thought I would start off by reading the abstract or the summary that Jim Hansen uh, provides for this Hope versus Hopium paper. So here we go. So accumulating evidence supports the interpretation in our pipeline paper. That's the global warming in the pipeline paper published last November. Decreasing human-made aerosols, increased Earth's energy imbalance and accelerated global warming in the past decade. Climate sensitivity and aerosol forcing, physically independent quantities, were tied together by the United Nations IPCC climate assessments that rely excessively on global climate models, GCMs, and fail to measure climate forcing by aerosols. By the way, I should say aerosols are like smoke particles from ships and coal plants and other industrial sources and cars and things like that. And they reflect the sun away and they also help form clouds that reflect the sun away. So that's what aerosols are. And that's a very important part of all of this. The IPCC's best estimates for climate sensitivity and aerosol forcing both understate reality. That's an extremely important sentence there. Preservation of global shorelines and global climate patterns, the world humanity is adapted to, likely will require at least partly reversing global warming. That's also a very important sentence. Required actions and time scales are undefined. A bright future for today's young people is still possible, but attainment is hampered by precatory or wishful thinking policies that do not realistically account for global energy needs and aspirations of nations with emerging economies. An alternative is needed to the global climate model dominated perspective on climate science. We will bear a heavy burden if we stand silent or meek as the world continues on its present course. So kind of like, wow, by the way, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, the press doesn't pay attention to this. James Hansen, who's, you know, warned us 40 years ago about what would happen, and almost all of his predictions from back then have come true. Things like, uh, you know, the global warming signal would uh, emerge from the noise, the Northwest Passage would be op open, uh, you know, wet places would get wetter, dry places would get drier, uh, on and on. Um, and he even predicted the temperature, and it was extremely accurate. Back in the 1980s, he predicted what the temperature would be today. So um, here he is telling us, and we're going to get into the details, but he, here he is telling us that the IPCC, or the International Panel on, Cli uh, International Panel on Climate Change, um, is both under-assessing uh, the impact of greenhouse gas warming and over, uh, 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 and also under-assessing the cooling from aerosols, so like from the industrial smoke. And the important thing to know about those two things is that the greenhouse gases, which the most important one is CO2, the CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years, but the aerosols last in the atmosphere for about a week before they fall out of the atmosphere. So we are living in a world today where we are experiencing stronger and stronger global warming. But that global warming is caused by greenhouse gases, again, CO2 and also methane, mostly. And then, but we're being cooled by the aerosols, which are continuously put into the atmosphere, about 100 million tons of sulfur spewed into the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels. And that helps seed clouds, it helps reflect the sun directly. And it makes clouds brighter, which helps re reflect the sun more. So we're cooling the earth 
with something that lasts in the atmosphere for a week, but we're warming the earth with things that last in the atmosphere for decades to centuries to millennia. And uh, Jim Hansen calls that our Faustian bargain or our deal with the devil. So we get to enjoy our fossil fuel energy without suffering all of the consequences because our pollution is cooling the earth. And what he's saying here in this one paragraph and, and what follows in this paper and is a central part of the global warming and the pipeline paper is that uh, the IPCC uh, has it wrong that warming from, from greenhouse gases is well, much more than they say, and the cooling from aerosols is okay. also much more. So you get the same temperature that we're experiencing, like 1.5. But instead of it being like uh, two degrees of warming from greenhouse gases and half a degree of warming from uh, aeros cooling from aerosols, maybe in reality it's three degrees of warming from uh, greenhouse gases and one and a half degrees of cooling from aerosols which would be a big problem as we start to clean up the aerosols. And that's what is happening already. Yes, uh, uh, Eli, were you saying something? Uh, no, I, I was just muting some people who were, were on oh. and there was background noise. Oh, okay. I could turn that off, by the way, and maybe I should have done that. Um, but I have to get to... Yeah, it's a little weird when you're sharing the screen like this to, to get to the all the controls. Here we go. Um, okay, I'm going to turn that off. Um, okay, so that shouldn't be a problem now. Um, okay, so that's the basis of what's happening here. And if you kind of don't remember anything else, remember that, that James Hansen is saying that the warming that we're creating through the burning of fossil fuels is actually more than, than what everyone thinks. So uh, I'm going to turn this down a little bit more. There we go. Okay. Anyway, so let's get into it. Um, that's, that's the basis, and that's kind of what you need to know, but there's a lot more interesting detail in this Hope versus Hopium paper. It's, I think, four pages long. And... Um, Anyway, it it starts off with a very funny dig at Michael Mann. Michael Mann is also a very well-known climate scientist who's most famous for coming up with what's called the hockey stick graph. Um, and he took a lot of shit from climate deniers over the years and was really uh, attacked by right-wing folks who were against, you know, climate change, if you can be against physics, but they were. But now he writes lots of books, and he's a big guy on Twitter, and he blocks anyone who questions him or even refers to Jim Hansen's uh, work, which is what he did to me. He blocked me after like referring to Jim Hansen's global warming in the pipeline paper. But uh, Jim Hansen starts off this paper by saying, our global warming in the pipeline paper was greeted by a few scientists among the most active in communications with the public with denial. In other words, the, 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 the scientists that have the biggest public following um, greeted, the, the denied the, 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 um, that the global warming in the pipeline paper was correct. Our friend Michael Mann, for example, with a large public following, refused to concede that global warming is accelerating. We mentioned Mike because we know that he won't take this notation personally, which I think is actually quite funny because my, Michael seems to take everything personally. But um, anyway, so this is the first time I've, I've seen Jim Hansen mention Michael indirectly without actually mentioning his name in previous things like this. But I don't recall him actually mentioning Michael by name. However, Michael did publicly come out right after the Global Warming the Pipeline paper was published and said without any evidence, I mean, he didn't say, he just said it was wrong, but he didn't say why it was wrong. He didn't go into the, you know, the paper is very detailed and gives lots of evidence and stuff. He didn't go through the evidence and say, no, no, I don't believe this evidence. He was just saying the whole thing was wrong. So 
anyway, I think it's pretty funny that he starts this um he starts this uh, uh paper off with a little dig at Michael Mann. Well, not not only that, he very quickly went ad hominem uh, uh against Leon by saying, "Oh, oh look, you true. know, one one of, one of the authors, you know, doesn't have a degree in climate science and like the implication is that somehow he hoodwinked like all of the other climate scientists on right. the paper, which, you know, is, I mean, if that's your argument, damn, you're reaching. Yeah, right. Well, uh, by the way, and we um, also in the link to, um, I should start off by saying the, the link in the description, uh, both on Clubhouse and YouTube, is the link to the interview we did with Jim Hansen uh, a few months ago. And you can listen to that. That's about the global warming of the pipeline paper. And we also have done several interviews with Leon Simons, and you can uh, find that on our uh, YouTube channel, which also has links in the description as well. So anyway, they start off uh, in the first couple of graphs. And this is um, interesting here. This is um, Delta T. So Delta means the change. And T in this case is global temperature or, or temperatures at different latitudes on the earth. And there, there's two ways to draw latitude. Like one is you have equal spacing from zero to 90 degrees. 90 degrees, by the way, plus is the North Pole. Minus 90 degrees is the South Pole. But at the South Pole, there's almost no land, right? It's a little tiny spot. And at the equator, that's where all, you know, you know, one plus or minus one degree above the equator is a huge amount of land, but minus one degree at 90 degrees is almost nothing. So because the earth is a sphere and the things at the top are small and the, the, the big bands around the center are wide. So they also uh, do an area weighting graph on the right. So it's sort of the same graph, just the scale is different. You can see going from zero to 30 has a you know big gap, and but 30 to 60 is less, and 60 to 90 is almost nothing. And that's because at 90, it's the North Pole, and there's not a lot of land there. So this is just equal weighting of land for the latitude. But it doesn't matter too much. It just makes it easier to read in some, some ways. So the blue line is 1970 to 2010. And what the blue line represents is how fast the climate is warming at different latitudes. So this is saying that the equator, um, it was warming about uh, you know 0.17 or so degrees per decade, whereas in 2010 to 2023, so 1970, 2010 is a 40-year period, and 2010 to 2023 is a 13-year period. And we're going to see why 2010 is an important you know, starting date to look at. Uh, that's because uh, shipping rules began to change in 2015 and then in 2020. And so uh, that helped accelerate warming, as they're going to point out. And the way you can tell is while, you know, the around here, the warming rate didn't change much between the blue line and the red line. But when you get up into this the, this area here, you can see the warming went up a lot. And what is up here? This is the North Pacific Ocean and North Atlantic Ocean. So in other words, the Northern Ocean areas where most of the shipping occurs warmed a great deal. And there's also something happening in Antarctica, which we'll cover a little later too. But anyway, so, th so that's what the big deal is about this, is that when you look at a little more detail about warming, you can just say, well, you know, the global temperature is 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. But this is looking at it on a latitude basis. And we're seeing that the world hasn't warmed equally based on latitude. Um, and so, uh, in fact, it's actually the warming rate went down in Antarctica, which could actually have something to do with AMOC. But uh, here, clearly something's happening in the northern latitude, which, by the way, aren't re replicated really much in the southern latitudes, except when you get close to Antarctica. So that's part of the evidence that global warming, first of all, is accelerating, but also 
that what it might be due to. And so that's what he says here. Um, and he says the gl accelerated global warming is the first significant change of global warming rate since 1970. And as we'll see, which is going to come up in a little while, the graph, that the global warming, the world was warming at a very steady rate until, until recently. And uh, it's important, he said it's important because it confirms the futility of net zero hopium that serves as present energy policy. And because we are running short of time to avoid passing the point of no return. So the point of no return are tipping points. And he's going to talk in this paper about two particular tipping points. One is the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is uh, happening right now as we speak. It's not like some future thing. It's actually the process of breaking up and things like that. And that could lead to severe uh, sea level rise within this century. And we're going to talk about that. And then also the other one is, which we've talked about a lot, uh, climate chat is an AMOC collapse around mid-century. Uh, and both of those are points of no return that he's going to address in this paper. So and he also talks that he's very busy. So he's going to try to do these, he calls these notes, um, you know, every two months. And this is the March note. So anyways, we've talked about this graph and what it means. Again, just for a quick summary, uh, the blue line is warm is is warming per decade in 1970 to 2010. And the red line is more recent warming. And what it says in the North Atlantic, North Pacific region, uh, the world has, uh, global warming has accelerated a lot, quite a difference. Like, by the way, just look at this. This is 0.2 degrees per decade, and here we're up over 0.7 degrees per decade. So only in this North Atlantic region, I mean, tremendous acceleration and warming, which led to the overall acceleration of the global warming, like the average temperature. So anyway, really important stuff. And to emphasize it a little more, here's a picture. You can see this is North America here, South America, Africa. Asia, China, Russia, Europe over here on, on this side too. And these big red blobby areas are, the, this is the Atlantic, North Atlantic, this is North Pacific. And this is percent of sulfate from ships prior to the International Maritime Organization regulations on fuel sulfur. So it's saying that of all the sulfates given off, the percent coming from ships is enormous in, uh, you know, this in the 80, 70, 80, 90 percent range in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. So the point being that uh, these new regulations required an 80 percent reduction in sulfur emissions from ships. And that obviously would reduce the sulfur greatly in these areas, which is what we saw. And uh, that caused uh, accelerated global warming. So that's what. Anyway, so then he talks about the actual global warming that we're seeing. He's saying from 2010 to 2023, it's been uh, warming at 0.3 uh, degrees Celsius per decade, which, which is 67% faster than the 0.18 degree per decade in the 1970 to 2010 period when warming was going up at a steady rate. And we're gonna see that in a graph coming up. The recent warming is different, peaking in the 30 to 60 degrees north, which we just saw in that the picture, you know, where, where the Northern Atlantic, North the Pacific area is. Um, and then he talks, I don't wanna read everything in here, but that we just went through those pictures. And then he talks about aerosol forcing, which is what the sulfur causes. Sulfur is, sulfates are aerosols or small particles that both reflect the sun themselves, but they also help form clouds. They make clouds last longer. They make clouds be brighter. And all of those things help reflect the sun. In fact, I, I believe that that effect uh, of aerosols on clouds is bigger than the effect of the aerosols just reflecting the sun themselves. And that's important because that it helps explain why cutting back on aerosols can have such a big effect. 
In fact, as he's going to say later, they believe the effect of the aerosols is 10 times more than what the IPCC says. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. But the important thing to know is that aerosol climate forcing is unmeasured. In other words, there aren't satellites directly measuring it. We, we kind of figure it out by looking at other things. And they infer the aerosol fo forcing from, um, well, he talks about why it has the impact on clouds. Um, they, they infer it from the Earth's absorbed solar radiation, ASR. That is how much energy the Earth is absorbing from the sun and the Earth's energy imbalance, which is the difference between how much energy the Earth absorbs from the sun and how much energy the Earth emits into space. So the Earth is warm. It, it's like, if you think about it, like a called a black body radiation, anything that's warm radiates infrared heat away from it. And that's how the Earth stays cool and or it stays at the, the temperature it was at. So before the um, <laughs> Industrial Revolution, the Earth got energy from the sun and it radiated heat out into space. Those two things were equal, so the Earth's temperature didn't change. And then what happened? We started burning fossil fuels, and that created a blanket of greenhouse gases around the Earth that was thicker than before. In fact, so far, we've increased the CO2 blanket by 50%. We added a trillion tons of uh, CO2 into the, uh, well, that, that's the extra. We put more than a trillion tons in the atmosphere. A trillion tons remains. There were two trillion tons before, so now it's three trillion tons. And that causes the Earth to not be able to radiate as much heat out into space. And therefore, uh, there's more, uh, more energy coming in than going out. And the Earth then therefore warms. And as it warms, it will radiate more heat out into space. And eventually, if we stopped adding greenhouse gases, things would stabilize again at a higher temperature. But uh, of course, we're continuing to put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate. It's uh, For those of you who think we're fighting climate change, all you need to know is that uh, fossil fuel emissions are at a record high right now. That's about all you really need to know. So he's talking about these important parameters. We're going to see some graphs on this coming up. But Earth's absorbed solar radiation is how much energy the Earth is absorbing from the sun. That's affected by the sun. If the sun gets brighter, it would absorb more. If the, get, if the sun gets uh, uh, sends out less energy, and it does, the sun does vary a little bit over an eleven-year cycle, and there can be longer cycles. But the bottom line is, the sun has not gotten hotter this century as the Earth was warming. I mean, there does have this eleven-year cycle, and we're starting to reach the peak of that cycle. But the Earth was warming a lot when the sun was actually a little bit cooler than average. So it's not the sun; it's not the sun that's causing global warming. But it is uh, obviously it is the sun providing the energy to the Earth, and then we're doing things to screw around with the atmosphere, which is causing the Earth two things to happen: one, the greenhouse gases that are trapping the heat, but also aerosols which are changing the reflectivity of the earth so when you uh increase aerosols you get more clouds and you get more aerosols both of those make the earth brighter and therefore reflect more of the incoming solar radiation out into space before it has a chance to warm the earth but now we're decreasing aerosols and that ends up decreasing clouds too and both of those things make the Earth darker and therefore absorb more incoming solar radiation. So that's what's happening. That's what's causing this acceleration in global warming. And um, it's just talking about how they can measure the Earth energy imbalance. They can measure the absorbed solar radiation. And from that, you can kind of figure out what's happening with aerosols since we're not directly measuring aerosols. Um, and global absorbed solar radiation has increased so, dramatically. So a, a quick, Go ahead. 
Eli? Yeah, quick point. Um, so, uh, and Leon made this point uh, in, in some tweets, man is not only, you know, disagreeing with Hansen, but he's, he's actually disagreeing with data, data from NASA, right? right. Uh, uh, which, which does directly measure or very comes close to directly measuring this. We still need more data and more ways of tracking the data, uh, you know, there, there are satellites that have just been launched that will help us with things like methane and phytoplankton, uh, but uh, and and aerosols. You know, in in time we will be measuring them more directly. But the bottom line is, mm -hmm. uh, man is arguing against data. Well, but I don't want to just make it about man because you know Jim Hansen wrote this paper before the COP twenty eight, and then he was invited by some people there to give a talk on this. And then he was disinvited by the IPCC to come talk about it. So that's like the whole fucking, <laughs> you know, climate science community saying, we don't want to hear from you, Jim, telling us that we're all wrong. And then that global warming is actually more than we say. And aerosol cooling is more than we say. And therefore, we're in a more precarious situation. Because what, what it means is as you, let's say you get to net zero, when you get to net zero, you're also at zero um, aerosols because the aerosols come from our, you know, mostly come from burning fossil fuels. So as you finally get to net zero, you say, "Ah, oh, great, I reached net zero. And then you find out that the warming from the greenhouse gases you already put in the atmosphere, it's much more than you thought. And the cooling you were experiencing from the aerosols is much more than you thought. So now you're left with no aerosols and a lot more warming. So instead of, you know, hitting, um, just pick some numbers here, two degrees, if you were really damn lucky, but you'd have to be super lucky uh, to hit two degrees at net zero in 2050, you're, you're, you're at three degrees or something at that point, which means your plans for net zero in 2050 are totally inadequate. And you actually have to be doing a lot more now. And as Jim points out, in addition to reducing your emissions, which you have to do, um, you also have to um, take other steps to lower the earth energy imbalance. He doesn't like to talk about it directly, but what he means by that is solar radiation management, sunlight reflection methods, solar geoengineering that goes by a lot of different names, and also taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the right. things we talk about a lot on uh, on climate chat. Yeah, Eli. What what uh, you know when 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 people talk about you know hitting three degrees, I, I think that that something that few people appreciate is that you know we you know, the the IPCC and climate scientists have have been doing a lot of of work because it's hard to try and understand feedbacks, both amplifying and attenuating feedbacks, and. To the extent we are looking at, you know, building that based or, or evaluating that based on empirical data, right? We're looking at, you know, what which of those feedbacks start to happen, you know, around one degree, you know, around 1.5 degree where we are now. Uh, what they are like at two degrees and three degrees uh, is it involves increasing guesswork, right? And there is enough uncertainty about things that involve less guesswork, uh, uh, and we'll we'll talk. I, I hope to talk about okay. a couple of those later. But uh, okay. uh, you know, the, stopping at three, I think I think even that is if if we get there, I, I staying there just seems like uh, how is that going to happen? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, he's talking about how the absorbed solar radiation has increased dramatically since 2010, and again. This is like uh, right after 2010 is when the International Maritime Organization passed new rules that all big ships had to start using lower sulfur fuels. They used to use something called bunker fuel, which is the dirtiest, thickest fuel. You had to heat it up just to burn it, just so it would flow into your engine. But uh, then, now they have these rules starting in 2015, I believe, that you had to clean it up somewhat. And by 2020... It had to be 80% less than it used to be. So a very dramatic change in sulfur emissions over all ships in a very short amount of time. And since 2010, uh, well, it, it increased more than 1.4 watts per square meter, which doesn't sound like a big number, but that's equivalent to a million or so Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every day. 
on Earth, the, the amount of heat energy equivalent. Um, and that he said that's equivalent to a CO2 increase of more than 100 parts per million. So just since 2010, it's as if we've increased CO2 by 100 parts per million. The absorbed solar radiation is not due to a brightening sun. It's due to a darkening Earth. In other words, we're decreasing our aerosols, making the Earth darker so it's absorbing more sunlight. Our task is to learn how much of this darkening is a climate feedback due to decreasing ice and snow and cloud albedo, albedo's reflectivity. Yeah, what says that? And how much is climate forcing due to our decreasing of aerosols? In other words, so the ice and snow is a feedback to warming and cloud changes can happen due to warming and it could be more or less clouds due to warming. And that changes reflectivity, but the actual pumping of aerosols into the atmosphere is a human forcing, something we are actively doing. And by the way, we're doing it today on a massive scale, pumping a hundred, all done by accident from burning coal plants and ships and cars and stuff. Uh, but it's a massive amount, 100 million tons a year or so, if I remember correctly. So anyway, uh, let's keep moving on. The They talk about the zonal uh, absorbed solar radiation and how, like, here's a map showing, uh, this, is, this is all relative to the first 10 years. And so yellow, um, blue is a little bit of cooling, yellow is a little bit of uh, warming, and then you get into the orange or red, and that's a lot of warming. And you can see uh, going from 2000 to 2023, that um, uh, you can see global warming is occurring. In other words, we're going from kind of just a little bit of you know, blue and yellow. This is all relative to the 2000 here, the 20, 2000 to 2010, I guess, is the reference point. And then it gets warmer, warmer, warmer. But look, it's getting warmer here. Uh, and this is this is global. So this is land and ocean. But it, it's getting warmer near the where the North Pacific and North Atlantic is and a little bit here in the uh, South Pacific as or South Pacific South um, Atlantic and maybe you know Africa South America area but then um, so we see that when this graph is very interesting because this is sea surface temperature SST sea surface temperature but it's the same kind of graph where we look at latitudes, uh, you know, from zero to 90 degrees, again, North Pole, not minus 90 is the South Pole. And some very interesting things pop up. You see in the near the equator, a few of these little hot spots pop up at certain points here, here, and another one here. The, this is when there is an El Nino, because an El Nino makes the uh, equatorial Pacific warmer than normal. It's when sort of warm water from below the ocean kind of comes to the surface. It helps heat the atmosphere too. And that makes El Nino years a little warmer than average. And then you'll see these yellow or white areas. This is These are La Niñas. This is when the equatorial Pacific is cooler than average. And we had a long La Niña here. And you can see the very beginning of the El Nino we're in right now. But, but in addition to this, two really important things to note is since 2020, things have really heated up a lot in the northern part where the North Atlantic and North Pacific is. So Hansen is saying this is due to the uh, decrease in aerosols from ships and therefore the decrease in reflectivity from the aerosols themselves but also very importantly, from the decrease in cloud cover. And by the way, you can see this uh, in satellite maps. You see, you can see these long white streaks of clouds, and that's the trail of a ship that's sending up sulfur particles into the atmosphere and causing a cloud to form, and it forms a long line. And you get enough of these, and it actually can reflect a bit of sunlight. So that's one thing you notice, but the other really interesting thing to notice is you go to the bottom here, and here is the south, uh, southern ocean, which circles Antarctica. 
And you say, okay, well, look, look over here on the left. It's yellow, mostly yellow. It's a little bit of warming, not much. And then, of course, as we global warming increases, everything's getting warmer and warmer and warmer, except down here along where the Southern Ocean is. It's staying about the same. It's not warming with the rest of the world. And you say, what is going on? And what Hansen is saying is going on is Antarctica is melting and putting that cold water into the ocean around Antarctica and keeping that ocean, relatively speaking, relatively cool compared to the rest of the world, which is being warmed by global warming. And so that's um, not a good thing. Because what it means is Antarctica is melting and that contributes to sea level rise. And he's going to talk about more of that later. But this is actually a really important graph. And this next one is um, surface temperature. When So not SST is sea surface temperature. Surface temperature is both ocean and land. And this also, you can see these uh, El Ninos, the big ones here. And the 2016 was a really big one. And this is the beginning of the one we're in right now. But also some things you see, again, you see this mostly yellow at the bottom, which is, again, uh, the ocean around Antarctica, mostly staying cool from the melting of Antarctica. But you can see below that is Antarctica itself. And you can see that's parts of that are starting to get uh, quite warm. But up in the Arctic, the North Pole area, things are getting extremely warm. Purple is, you know, five C, well, up to four point nine C of warming, and this and 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 this is what's called Arctic amplification, where as the Earth as an, uh, uh, gets warmer overall, the Arctic's going to get warmer than the rest, because, uh, for example, um, as you melt the Arctic sea ice, which is over the ocean, not over land. Um, it, ex it changes from a very reflective ice color of white to a very dark ocean color. So instead of reflecting 80% of the incoming sunlight, it absorbs 80% of the incoming sunlight. And that's one reason why the Arctic is warming faster than everywhere else. The uh, Antarctica is ice mostly on land. And so it doesn't have that same effect happening. But there is sea ice around um, Antarctica, which is dramatically decreased in the last few years. And that actually does have an impact on the amount of sunlight being reflected from the earth. Anyway, so that's a lot to talk about there. Um, and they talk about this. I, I basically summarize what's, what's going on. Um, but one thing, um, let's see. To aid in understanding, increasing solar heating of the earth um, is, a, is caused by darkening of the earth. And, uh, and he talks, and so here we have two other graphs, which are also, they're, all those graphs are very interesting when you understand what they're showing you. So on the left, we're, and I can, can I zoom in on there? I guess I can here, make it a little easier to see. Um, this is absorbed solar radiation. So this is how much sunlight the earth is absorbing. And you'll see that it was, you know, kind of going up and down, but kind of staying the same. But around 2015, something happened and it's kind of like higher than it used to be. And then starting in 2020, it's even higher. So what happened in 2015? Well, the International Maritime Organization's rules for low sulfur uh, fuels for ships went into effect and they got stronger in 2020. And when you had to have, a, I don't remember what it was in 2015, but then by 2020, you have an 80% reduction in sulfur. So this is simply a graph showing something was going on here. And uh, look, the earth is absorbing more energy than it used to. And then um, on this side, this is the earth energy imbalance, or this is the, so this one is how much energy the earth absorbs from the sun. This is how much energy the earth absorbs from the sun minus how much the earth radiates out back into space. And obviously, as you kind of absorb more energy, the earth, you know, is not going to necessarily emit more energy right away until it warms up, by the way. Um, but you can see the same effect that the earth 
energy imbalance. And to put it super simply, the earth energy imbalance is the thing that causes global warming. I'll say that again. The earth energy imbalance is the thing that causes global warming. When the earth absorbs more energy than it releases out into space, the earth gets warmer. And by the way, as the earth gets warmer, it will send more energy out into space. So if you just put a little bit of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and stopped, the earth would warm a bit and then it would start emitting as much as it's absorbing and everything would be equal and it would stop warming. But right now we're doing two things. We're making the earth have a thicker greenhouse glass, gas blanket by continuing to emit a record amount of fossil fuel emissions. And we're also making the earth darker by decreasing the pollution, the aerosols that we put into the atmosphere through ships, mostly here, but in other, but even coal plants are cleaning up their sulfur emissions too, using sulfur scrubbers and they're decreasing the amount of coal plants in some places. Um, and because of that, the earth is getting darker and therefore absorbing more. So it's the combination of those two things. You can see that uh, uh, it jumped up and now it's even higher than it was before. And this is dramatically different. You know, in 2000, what, from 2000 to 2015, it was 0.61. And now it's 1.36. Of course, the earth is, global warming is accelerating because the earth energy imbalance is going up. We want it to be going down. That is what we need to make happen. So that's another reason why people are smoking hopium if they just think everything's going to be fine if we just get to net zero by 2050. And that's all we so, should so, worry about. So the okay, ELI ahead, Eli. five, the ELI five uh, description of of what we're doing, kind of zooming out big picture, is you know imagine it's it's a a cool sunny day. You're lying down outside. You have two white blankets on you, and you're pretty comfortable, right? And then like you throw on a third dark blanket. Right. right. <laughs> that's 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 the CO two and the radiative forcing. And yep. uh, the trouble is, it's it's not so easy to take the the third blanket off uh, um, under the current set of uh, uh, assumptions and the path that we're on. It doesn't mean that there aren't things we can do about it. There are lots of things we can do about it. And if we only would start uh, seeing them a bit differently, uh, I think uh, uh, we wouldn't be talking about hopium. We would be talking about uh, uh, a good plan. Okay. So by the way, this that yeah, thanks. And the, this next part I think is really interesting because when Jim and Leon came out with this paper late last year about global warming the pipeline, they were saying, look, you know, decreases in aerosols from shipping has caused this incredible acceleration in global warming. And a bunch of climate scientists, including the Zeke Hoff's father, um, said, no, no, it can't be that. Because we, you know, we calculate the impact of changing aerosols and ships, and we show it to be if you had a hundred percent change, uh, it would cause a change of forcing of zero point zero seven nine, or to call it zero point zero eight uh, watts per square meter. But Hansen's number is actually zero point point five to point seven, ten times more. And his number is for an 80% reduction, whereas the, the, the Zeke's number is for a 100% reduction. So in other words, you know, really when you compare what Zeke thinks the impact of shipping aerosols is, Hansen's number is literally 10 times more. 10 times more. And that's a big disagreement in science, by the way. And therefore more work will be done on this. This, this update, this note from Hansen, is basically saying, look, the data is going in our favor that shows that we were right. Um, you know, he's not saying, you know, absolutely, you know, he's not saying that people can't criticize his paper, but he's saying that the evidence seems to be going in, in his direction. And um, and it's not just one thing. It's many, uh, you know, lines of evidence that they're using. But that's this is really interesting because I did remember seeing so, Zeke post so that the shipping thing can't possibly be it because it's way too small. 
And this explains what's going on. Is Hansen's number is ten times more than what Zeke Zeke is using? Yeah, go ahead, Eli. Yeah, um, one one of the major sources of the disagreement is uncertainties about uh, uh, the way aerosols form clouds, and mm -hmm. this is actually a very very complicated scientific problem. And like to to get to anything that you can put in climate models. Uh, you need to make assumptions, right? You try to base right. them as much as possible on on whatever you know reasonable data you can find. But uh, to to put it politely, there are a lot of gaps there. And uh, what we're seeing is, you know, nature is giving us the answer, and well, exactly, uh, Han Hansen is quantitating it. And uh, the people at the IPCC who are very model oriented, uh, you know, are holding their models tight. Well, that's exactly what he then goes on to say in the following sections here, is that exactly what you said, is that um, the IPCC gets their numbers from global climate models, but those global climate models are adjusted over time to fit with the measured data. That's why they fit the measured data, is they just keep changing the models. But that doesn't mean that the Earth is really doing what the models say, Um and so, so where does the IPCC aerosol forcing come from? That's the one that's 10 times lower than what Hansen has. It says not from global measurements, because that's what he's getting it from. He's showing you the data. Here's the Earth energy imbalance measured from satellites and stuff. And look, we can calculate the impact of the shipping. He says, no, not from global measurements, as will be described in his upcoming book, Sophie's Planet, uh, which, by the way, my sister is the publisher for that. Um such measurements were proposed to measure from you know, to actually measure it, but that was not done uh, for political reasons. NASA wanted a different mission, and uh, so they, they kind of skipped that part. Um, he said the aerosol for IPCC aerosol forcing is just the forcing required for the global climate models to yield global warming comparable to what we observe. <laughs> so if you assume that the warming from greenhouse gases is less, then you can just say that the cooling from aerosols is less and everything works fine in your model. But that doesn't mean that's what's happening in the real world. So this is, he talks about it this way. Uh, someone pointed out that individual models in the model fog, they run all these um, runs of the model over and over again, and, and you get various you know results based on different assumptions, but you sort of get this trend in the middle, but it's, he calls it a model fog. Each tend to yield global warming comparable to observations, even though the models differed in many ways and had a range of climate sensitivities. This result is at least partially explained by the fact that the aerosol forcing is not well constrained. So what happens is people use different uh, assumptions for how much warming greenhouse gases cause, for example, yet they still end up with the same global temperature in their model. You say, well, wait a second. You assumed a warmer uh, thing here and that model, you ran it again with a lower sensitivity. So you, you would think that the temperature should change if you assume global warming, uh, greenhouse gases cause more warming. But the reason, but they don't do that because they don't know what the aerosols are. So they just change the aerosol cooling to match the measured temperature we see in the world. So the so a model that has a very high climate sensitivity would have a very high aerosol cooling, and those with a low climate sensitivity would have a, a lower aerosol cooling. Since no one knows what the aerosol cooling is, no one can say your model's wrong, and the model happens to show the right temperature, because you want your model to show the temperature that we're measuring out in the real world, and that's what he's saying. He's saying that the fact that you know aer aerosols aren't a constrained quantity based on real data, they're just making shit up, I guess is the way to put it in a, in a exactly. scientific term. So. Exactly. The, the, um, uh, so, so nobody wants their model to, to disagree with everybody else's because, you know, then you're not, you're the unpopular kid. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, and so they, they adjust some parameters and, uh, to quote uh, John von Neumann, uh, give me three parameters. I'll give you an elephant four and I'll make his trunk wiggle. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, he goes on to talk more about this. Is uh, there are two, there are two reasons why the climate modelers did not want to include the full aerosol forcing in their models. First, many of the oceans models tended to mix heat into the deep ocean too effectively, 
which meant the, the models needed a slight exaggerated forcing to match observed surface warming. Increasing net forcing could be achieved with a smaller aerosol forcing. Second, and more important, the models tended to have climate sensitivities in the neighborhood of three degrees for doubling of CO2. With such climate sensitivity, only a moderate aerosol forcing is needed. And that's what I was saying. Jim Hansen in his Global Warming in the Pipeline paper said, it's not three degrees for a doubling of CO2. It's 4.8 degrees. So when you only use three degrees, you don't need to have a lot of aerosol forcing uh, to counter that. But if you're if it's really 4.8 degrees, then you need to have more aerosol to, to match the temperatures we see in the real world. And then he goes on to say, by the way, he's not blaming um, uh, the climate modelers. He said he got it wrong in the past. As everybody gets it wrong, you know, in, at various times. Um, so he's just making a, he's just saying, look, I'm not taking a dig at climate modelers. This is, he's just explaining the situation and why it is the way it is. And he just wants to, you know, make sure he, it's not like insulting all the climate modelers out there. Um, and the basic difficulty in cloud modeling is that it's hard. It's very hard to do. And, uh, you know, and he talks about that. So, um, uh, and then he starts to talk about the fact that his paper shows the climate sensitivity for a doubling of CO2 is, you know, four to six degrees, not three degrees as the IPCC uses. And that he's saying that someone did a study showing that models that assume a higher climate sensitivity are yield much better agreement with satellite observations of seasonal and latitudinal cloud changes. The low sensitivity models do not even have the correct sense of the changes. They go, when it gets warmer or cooler. Uh, so he's saying that these other studies kind of help reinforce his conclusion that um, that, that the climate sensitivity is 4.8 degrees for a doubling of CO2 instead of three, because it does a better, the models do a better job of not only the global temperature, which you can fudge by using a different aerosol value, but when you look at it, you know, it's a, a cloud cover and you know, latitudinal changes and things like that, like we looked at previously in some of the pictures, it uh, the ones with the higher climate sensitivity do a better job of re reflecting what the real world shows us. And he said, high climate sensitivity is a double whammy. High sensitivity implies a large negative aerosol forcing because aerosol forcing, un forcing unfortunately, so far has been an implied quantity, as we just talked about, not a directly measured quantity. Further evidence that the IPCC underestimates aerosol forcing is provided in our pipeline paper. For example, greenhouse gas climate forcing increased by half a watt over the per meter squared over the past 6,000 years. Yet global temperature held steady or declined slightly, especially in the Northern hemisphere. Given that greenhouse gases and aerosols are the two significant global forcings, and the fact that wood burning was the fuel source as, a, as civilization developed, we argue that human-made aerosol forcing was already at least negative 0.5 watts per square meter in 1750 when the IPCC assumes it was zero. And we argue that the release of aerosols in burning of wood and other biofuels has not decreased globally since 1750. So anyway, so it's basically say, and, and this is an interesting part of his global warming, the pipeline paper is that, you know, global Man's impact on the climate didn't start in 1750. We've been growing rice for thousands of years. That releases methane. We've been burning wood, which creates aerosols, which reflect the sun, on and on. And, and so this is to getting to that a little bit. So decreased aerosol forcing since 2010, again, mostly because of this International Maritime Organization shipping fuel regulation, um, accelerates global warming and in combination with a moderate El Nino accounts for the magnitude and geographical location of the unusual 2023 warming. There is no need for concern that the physics of the climate system has changed because what was happening is Jim published his paper. It said, this is why the world is warming. The IPCC said, Jim is wrong, but we can't explain the 2023 warming. 
like maybe we have the physics wrong. Maybe our models aren't right. You know, they were like scratching their head. Why is the warming happening right now? We can't explain this large magnitude of warming in 2023. And Jim Hansen say, well, yeah, it's right here. This is why it's happening. And so that one hand, they were denying he was right. And that the other thing they were saying is we, we don't understand what's going on, which is kind of a weird you know, stance to take when someone's explaining what's going on. And, and, and uh, you know, this is this is where we take them at their word. Right. They don't understand what's going on. And when <laughs> when you deal with unexpected uncertainties, you know, that's that's when you start being, you know, much more cautious. And in the case of the climate, being more cautious is, you know, doing your best to emit less, uh, doing your best to uh, uh, figure out, you know, what what you can do uh, about about the causes that that humans have caused. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody wants to keep uh, uh, stratospheric aerosol injection off the table. That's that's really, I think, what is driving uh, Michael Mann. Mm -hmm. um, he's very, very concerned about geoengineering in general and uh, stratospheric aerosols in particular. And uh, um, I mean, I there are lots of things I don't like it, but you, you know, if 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 you have two choices, a is uh, fasten your seatbelts for unmitigated climate change, climate disruption, uh, and B is uh, uh, let's let's see how it goes with stratospheric aerosols while we get it together and do all of the things that we should have been doing starting in 1980 at least, right? Uh, I will mm -hmm. take B every time. Okay. So um, anyway, so you talk, then Jim gets into the El Nino, La Nina, because a lot of people are saying, the climate scientists are saying, well, we have a super El Nino, uh, you know, so that's what's causing all this warming in 2023. Yeah, I mean, it would have to be a really strong El Nino to explain the crazy warming we had in 2023. But, you know, maybe that's what it is. It's a super El Nino like we had in 2016 and uh, before that. And Hansen says, well, no, not really. He says, yeah, if you look at the warming in what's called the Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature area, which is a little rectangle in the, excuse me, in the um, Pacific Ocean equatorial region where they kind of use to measure El Nino and La Nina, you can see that it's pretty high, not as big as it was before in 2016, but still pretty high. But when you look at a broader area of warmth in the Pacific, um, you see that it's really not as big as these other ones. So in other words, it is an El Nino. It's just not a super El Nino. And he, he, he spends a few paragraphs explaining why that is. And that's important because if it's not a super strong El Nino that's driving this warming we saw in 2023, it has to be something else. And the scientists uh, who say Jim Hansen's wrong, they don't have the something else to explain why it was warming so much. Hansen's saying it was shipping. And again, his number for the impact of the shipping is 10 times higher than what the IPCC assumes in their models. And he's basically saying over and over again, <laughs> your models are wrong. Warming from greenhouse gases is more than you think, and the cooling from aerosols is also more than you think. That's why we both agree on what the temperature is. But if it's if Hansen's right, we're in for a lot more warming when we get to net zero than uh, if the IPCC is right. So um, anyway, so he spends a bunch of time talking. I don't want to get into that, but a bunch of time explaining why this El Nino isn't as strong as what some people thought, if you really look at it the right way. And here's a, some more pictures of, this is uh, warming um, temperatures based on the beginning of the El Nino. One was the 1997-98, the blue line, uh, that, that El Nino, 2015, 2016, a very strong El Nino. And the current El Nino, which we're not finished with yet, but you can see that it just hasn't really reach the temperatures of the previous El Nino. So it's not as strong as those. Therefore, you can't use it as an excuse for the extremely high temperatures we had in 2023. And this is just looking at the similar thing in a different way here. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. And then these are just 
sort of uh, heat maps of the globe for, for those numbers there. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but here is perhaps a super, super important graph, which Hansen has updated since the uh, global warming, the pipeline data, uh, pipeline. So this is a graph of global warming. So uh, this is uh, the bottom are years starting 1950, and this is the end is 2050. So as they say, you are here in 2023, 2024. And you can see it's starting in 1970 when we passed the Clean Air Act. You know, by the way, uh, uh, you could say, well, why wasn't it warming before? Well, it was, it was kind of warming a little bit, but our aerosols are smoke from industrialization, which was unmitigated. Uh, you know, we just, you know, America, America had lots of coal plants. All the developed world had lots of coal plants. We didn't have sulfur scrubbers on them. So we were emitting lots of sulfur into the atmosphere, which cooled the earth <clears throat> while we were adding greenhouse gases. But then we passed the Clean Air Act and we got sort of pollution under control somewhat. And ever since that time, uh, our warming has been dominated by the greenhouse gases. And we had a very steady, steady warming of 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade from 1970 up until about 2010. And then something seemed to happen. And what that something happening is uh, we continue to keep putting more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, just like before. But then we started to clean up our aerosols and again, passing the uh, uh, International Maritime Organization things in uh, 2015, and uh, let's see. So this is no, this is 2015. So right here, is that right? Uh, no, it's 2030. Oh, 2020. So 20, here, and um, and we don't have a lot of data yet. But what Hansen is saying, this is the green dotted line, is if the world continued to warm at the same 0.18 degrees per. Uh, decade rate, but you can see that's not happening. You know, even the lowest numbers, uh, lowest, the coolest years, you know, following uh, 2020 are on the line. They're not below the line. During La Nina, they should be below the line and above the, on during El Nino, they should be above the line. But he's saying that this pink area is probably where we're going to end up in 2024 which is more than one and a half degrees, one and a half to 1.6, maybe 1.7 degrees. But since it's not a very strong El Nino, he's saying it won't be as much as we thought, but still way, way, way hot. And what they're saying is they expect the next La Nina cooling period in the future, hasn't happened yet. We're in the middle of the El Nino now, but the La Nina will be future that when it happens, that will still be above the former projected average and that means that the average between the warm el nino and the la and the cool la nina will be about one and a half degrees which is right here between the two so once you have the peak above 1.5 and the cool below 1.5 and your average is 1.5 well you're at 1.5 degrees of warming at that point. This is that number that everyone's saying, oh, we have to stay below 1.5. Oh, even though we hit it last year, you know, that's not the average, the long-term 20, 30 year average and all this kind of thing. Look, for all practical purposes, if he is indeed correct, and the next cooling is in this area, not below this trend line, like the IPCC would expect it to be, but that would be incredible incredible amount of cooling but if it if it is this high then we're basically at one and a half degrees and by the way two degrees is right up here which we can cross as soon as 2040 he was actually hinting that and by the way you could have see how these numbers go above the yellow line over here too and we're here above the yellow line well if we did that we could be above um two degrees for and not maybe the whole trend but for at least a year in like the 2030s instead of, uh, and and uh, the IPCC is saying, look, we're not going to hit it until like 2060. But uh, if Hansen's right, we're in this yellow zone here of accelerated warming, and that's what's going on there. And and so, if you look if you look at uh, 2030, right, the difference between the the green trend line based on on the 
the previous rate of warming and the top of the yellow band, right? That's, that's almost 0.5 degrees. So that is the difference between, you know, 1.5 degrees uh, and uh, two degrees, you know, right. later on in time. And remember in 2015, there was the the big meeting in Paris that said, oh, yeah, you know, two degrees will be worse than we thought. There are really good reasons to to uh, work really hard to try to keep it below one point five degrees. So this is why there there is, you know, so much heated disagreement uh, Mm -hmm. uh, about about this issue, because uh, uh, the implications are uh, global. Yep, that's true. I mean. And I, maybe I should say this once again. Everything we're discussing today, which comes from Jim Hansen's latest note, this is not what the IPCC is working on. This, is, when you hear about net zero, when you hear about you know climate change predictions, they're all basing it on what Hansen is saying is is bad data, incorrect models. Things are worse than what the IPCC is saying. And that, and by the way. We had um, uh, Kevin Anderson on it a couple of weeks ago, which you should definitely listen to that if you haven't heard that uh, talk yet. And he was saying, I asked him, what do you think about Jim Hansen? He says, well, he, Hansen might be right. But then he says, you know, but even if he wasn't right, even if the IPCC is right, we should still be cutting our emissions super fast anyway, and we're not doing that. In other words, uh, actually, Hansen takes a swipe at that a little later in this thing. But uh, um <laughs> that, that, that kind of hit me when he said it. Like uh, even even if Hansen's wrong and it's only as bad as the IPCC says, that's still really really bad, and we better get moving. And we're not. And and and, and that's uh, like what, yeah. another way of saying that is is that he this is recognizing that the IPCC is kind of the frog in or everybody's uh, um, the way people regard what the IPCC says is like the frog in boiling water. Yeah. Uh, what they are saying, and and Michael Mann also says that. You know, things are plenty bad, you know, if right. if I'm right and Hansen is wrong. And on that, he is absolutely correct. Things things Although are really he says that, but then he kind of, I mean, again, I looked it up. I couldn't believe he said it. I, I had to check it because he actually said that if we hit one, if we hit net zero by 2050, we can stay at one and a half degrees. We're at one and a half degrees right now. <laughs> he was saying it. I, I don't get it. I don't get what he's going on with them. Stacy, well, you have a it's, question it's hide, now? Hiding behind, it's hiding behind this 30-year moving average, right? Which okay. is totally inappropriate. Okay. Yeah. Stacy, you have a question? I see your hand is raised. Okay, maybe not. Well, if, by the way, if you do have questions, you want to participate and you're on the Zoom call, uh, you can raise your hand. We're going to get to questions in a little while. I do have to end this in 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. Um, so the summary. So this is the summary of uh, of what Hansen said to his note on hope versus hopium. He said you should have a three pronged research approach. Don't just use climate models, but also look at paleoclimate or I mean historic climate data going back thousands, millions of years, and and all use models and also use. Uh, current observations of what's happening, all of those together. Housing these three in the same university or the same climate assessment report is not sufficient. They must be housed in the same brains. (laughs) He's basically telling climate scientists to look at the whole picture. Don't just look at your models. Go look at the historical data and et cetera. And he gave some amazing numbers here, by the way. Um, he talks about the overemphasis on climate models. Um, anyway, th- th- we talked a lot about that. Uh, um, okay, so and uh, he talks the second thing: global warming is accelerating. That's what they say. Their their paper last year and the data up until now is showing that uh, you have to look at the absorbed solar radiation. You have to look at the Earth energy imbalance and. Um, he said that just the fact that the warming occurred in the North Atlantic and North Pacific region, that doesn't mean that it was caused by shipping. You have to look at other things to get, to give you confidence to say that. So it could be just a coincidence that the warming occurred there. Or maybe you know clouds were affected by something else during that time. 
So, um, but but so he then again gets back and looks at this picture again that we already looked at, and uh, we talked about that. Um, he talks about the El Nino not being as strong as we talked about before. And then he gets to a discussion. Well, first of all, he says this yellow band here at the near, around Antarctica where the, it hasn't warmed up as much as before. A feature of special note in figure five is the lack of warming in the Southern Ocean at latitudes near 60 degrees south. This feature is an indicator of approach to the point of no return. So he uses the point of no return really as a tipping point in the climate system. And I guess tipping point is different definitions by different people. I think he's trying to avoid that term. Well, he talks about it right here. The tipping point concept. Hold on one second. The tipping point concept implying an unstable climate response is misused and overused thus encouraging a fatalistic public response or, or, or climate change denial. Most phenomena described as tipping points are amplifying reversible feedbacks, not runaway processes. Taking melting permafrost and decreasing Arctic sea ice, these amplifying feedbacks increase regional and global climate change on decadal and longer timescales. The feedbacks grow while Earth radiation balance is positive, more energy coming in than going out, but once we reduce the climate forcing enough that Earth's energy imbalance becomes slightly negative, feedbacks will work in the opposite sense, helping us move global temperatures and climate patterns back towards their condition before human alteration of the planet began. So he's saying things like people say, oh, you know, the uh, ice melting in the Arctic, that's a tipping point. But a tipping point is something that on its own takes over and nothing you do after that can change it, at least on any reasonable time scale. He's saying that's not true of those kinds of things. Those are feedbacks. And if you, for example, use solar radiation management to cool the Arctic, the, the ice will grow again. So those are, you know, so that's what he's saying. But there are some tipping points that you can't stop. Attention should be focused on the danger of passing the point of no return when we lock in disastrous consequences that cannot be reversed on any time scale humans care about. The prime point of no return is the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. If we allow that to get well underway, and by the way, it is underway, we will lose the entire ice sheet quickly by paleo or by, you know, geologic standards, not by like necessarily human lifetimes, but still quite quickly. That ice sheet must have collapsed in the Eemian period when global temperatures were similar to today. That's before the last ice age. So, you know, there's we're in sort of the warm period following the last ice age. Well, the previous warm period before the last ice age, the temperature was about what it is today. And then... Um, they, there's evidence that shows that the West Antarctic icy collapsed back then and sea levels rose several meters in less than a century. Several meters, like 10 feet plus in less than a century. So that, that's a big deal. Moreover, and, today's uh, greenhouse gas levels and climate forcing now exceed that of the early Pliocene, which is like two and a half to five and a half, five and a half million years ago. Um, when, uh, when sea levels were 15 to 25 meters or 50 to 80 feet higher than today. So I'll say that a different way. The last time CO2 was as high as it is today, sea levels were about 75 feet higher than they are now. And that's not future CO2, which we're continuing to increase. The last time it was this high, which was many millions of years ago, way before humans walked the earth. That was the last time CO2 was 420 parts per million, 425 parts per million. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, yeah. if, if it's okay, um, since you're blocked from Michael Mann and we follow each other, we had an exchange um, yesterday he he wrote, who is talking straight with you on climate? Look at what they are emphasizing. Is it deep and immediate cuts in 
fossil fuel burning and carbon emissions, or is it geoengineering and carbon capture and promises of new energy technology that simply kicks the can down the road? And then this guy, Simon Oldridge, who wrote a, an article, I think, with Kevin Anderson. Mm -hmm. In case anyone thinks, why not have both? There's no evidence that carbon ca capture works at scale and a clear case that the gas industry's favorite tech, blue hydrogen, is a scam worse than burning coal, even if the carbon capture element worked. And I said, we cannot do just carbon capture. Anyone saying that is a fraud. But even if we magically cease burning all fossil fuels today, how would we get the CO2 we've emitted out of the atmosphere? And then Michael Mann said, Yes, in the long term, capture and sequestration may be advisable and needed, but the fossil fuel industry promoted lie is that it can be scaled up mean meaningfully over the next decade, the very time frame over which we must drastically slash emissions. And I said, thank you. So it is primary, primarily fossil fuel companies saying this. That makes more sense. We obviously can't trust a single thing that they say, but why refer to them as tech bros when they're the knuckle draggers continuing to lie? And then Simon wrote, tech bros like Bill Gates are also pushing engineered removals. I think it's a way of trying to justify their high carbon lifestyles and resist the system change necessary to address climate change. They probably also see the potential for earning money from state subsidies involved. I hadn't seen that response until I looked up this thread today. And so mm. I wrote back um, just that he couldn't possibly be saying that everything should stay as it is. We can't just continue that. We can just continue to burn it all right. And then I said, and how do we get the CO2 out? I want everything kept in the ground now, but I don't see it happening. How do we remove CO2 plus mitigate what we have done? And so... Mm. I'm okay. yeah, I'm trying I think to that gives a good fair and of course I, I don't want to get into that too much here because we've actually talked about that a lot here, of course. We talked about that with Kevin Anderson and everything. But the bottom line, as I would say, is that first of all, we're not cutting our emissions, number one. <laughs> we do need to cut them. I mean, I think anyone who takes climate change seriously says we have to cut our emissions uh, extremely fast, extremely urgently, dramatically, way more than we're even thinking of doing. And yet you can still believe that and say that itself won't be enough. That, by the way, very specifically what Jim Hansen is saying here is that that, first of all, it's not even happening, but it, that will not be enough to keep our children safe. Therefore, we must actually, on top of getting rid of, I mean, yeah, there is a fossil fuel industry saying, hey, let's just do this other stuff and not, don't ask us to cut our emissions because right. look, we can do the, that's true. But people who take climate change seriously say we have to shut down the fossil fuel industry. And on top of that, we still need urgently, we need, uh, uh, you know, solar radiation management and stuff to prevent the West Antarctic ice sheet from collapsing and the AMOC from shutting down. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, if those things happen, you know, who cares if we start to cut our emissions later, right? Well, we'll you'll still care because of other things. But um, so it, it's a false it's a false argument to say, oh, some people are saying this. Therefore, anyone who supports doing more than this one thing um, is, is is arguing for not doing that one thing. And that's absolutely not true. It's a total well, no, I mean, not false. only that, oh, I mean, oh, this, oh this and, is... and we just got a response. Michael Mann, I'm actually with Simon here. Please see my own commentary on Gates and a more detailed discussion in the new climate war. AKA yeah. by my book. So Stacy, um, so, uh, so this is go invite this is, Michael well, to be on climate chat, by the way, in your response. Sure. I'll say, I'll say we, no, we were just discussing I'd love, I'd love these, these issues. We'd love to have you on climate <laughs> chat. Okay. Yeah, please do that. I'll do that. So, he can, he so can this, promote his book too. That'd be fine. So. This is, this is um, uh, climate scientists engaged in technology forecasting. And, you know, and in, in, if, if in 1970, like somebody said, you know, so, solar, photovoltaics you know they're really interesting but uh you know they'll, they'll never scale that would have looked like a pretty 
solid argument. And it would have even looked like a, a solid argument if you said it looks like they'll ne never scale enough to make uh, enough of a difference on emissions. Uh, that that you know would have looked pretty solid, like through the knots, right? Uh, but now we're seeing the 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 slope of the curve, you know, go up again faster than was even projected ten years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, as as complicated as climate science is. Uh, at least you know the major variables in technology forecasting. Actually, you don't. You don't know what somebody's going to come up with uh, three years from now. So by the way, I want to keep. I, I have to finish here soon. So uh, more back to Hansen. What he's saying about these uh, points of no return. When will the West Antarctic ice sheet collapse? Nobody knows for sure. But uh, <laughs> we concluded in our ice melt paper, based on observed rates of ice shelf melting, that the world is nearing shutdown of the Atlantic overturning meridional circulation, the AMOC, uh, and and, uh, and the shutdown of deep water formation near Antarctica, which they call the SMOC for Southern Meridional Overturning Circulation. And uh, um, AMOC shutdown occurs in mid-century in our models if ice melt continues to grow. By the way, this is all mind-blowing stuff that the fact that press isn't even covering this is pretty crazy the amok shutting down as we've talked about earlier in a previous episode is so is, is I, a I life changing for everyone on earth let's put it that way i, I put a link to uh the a tweet of, of the most recent uh, carbon brief uh um blog okay. post which is about uh, polar sea ice arctic and antarctic and uh uh, it's well worth a read. Um, okay. One thing that that is is notable, uh, and and we're going to hear deniers talking about this, is that well, you know, sea ice extent uh, uh, came back pretty well, so so nothing to worry about. Uh, actually, big problem is that is that it's pretty thin. So, uh, yeah. which means next time around it will melt uh, very quickly. Yeah. So, uh, what's Time frame on point of no return, he said, by 2030, the date when nations are expected to have measurable progress in climate policies, it may at long last be recognized that the hoping we approach is not correct, <laughs> that Hansen was right, you know, by that, certainly by that, but probably sooner than that, they'll know about that. And the idea of net zero is like as being the savior is not re really possible. It's hopeless, as he puts it. Uh, and they, and he also says scientists have to improve their communication with the public, especially with young people. And of course, uh, one way to do that is to come on Climate Chat. So if you are out there, climate science is listening, you want to be on the Climate Chat program and talk about what you're doing, please let us know. You can reach me at climatechatclub at gmail.com, climatechatclub at gmail.com, or uh, you know, get through Twitter or something like that. Uh, communication, they're talking about the pipeline paper, they're talking about uh, some other things here, which I, uh, I'm not going to go through. He he then um, makes the point of uh, pushing for nuclear power. Jim is a big supporter of nuclear. I don't agree with him on all of that. I mean, not that I'm against nuclear. It's just that I think wind and solar can do more, cheaper, faster. Uh, and Jim doesn't believe that. He also takes a swipe at Amory Lovins, who's a famous guy in the uh, started the Rocky Mountain Institute and, and energy efficiency lives in a home that doesn't use any you know external energy and all that kind of stuff and he said that he convinced Bill Clinton that uh, wind and solar was and and efficiency was all you needed um and that's why we didn't get the support for for nuclear that Jim thinks was important and that's he, so he takes a swipe at him that uh, Jim is getting in his older age is taking a little more direct swipes at people than he usually would just infer their name without actually saying it. So, and he also talks about that they need funding in their group, uh, that somebody is retiring, they need to hire someone to replace them and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to help, um, there is a link uh, in my, I know, I, I don't know if I have it in the YouTube comment, maybe I should put it there, but in the tw Twitter summary link, which is in the YouTube comment, at the end of that is a link to the Columbia research group that Jim is part of where you can make donations if you like. So that, and he ends with some good news that a guy named Joe Kelly, who investigated ultra-fast response of the earth energy imbalance to a doubling for of, of CO2, um, is basically saying that the, the climate response quickly 
to changes in forcing. And of course, that's bad when you're warming the planet. But the point is, if we do take steps to cool the planet, to take these, uh, to to inter to like interfere in the warming, to try to reverse the geoengineering that we are doing to the planet and do things like, he doesn't mention it specifically, but sunlight reflection methods, for example, then the earth, the good news is the earth will respond quickly to those, especially to sunlight reflection methods in which it will respond in a year or two to cool the earth very quickly. And even saying, even if you took, you know, CO2 out of the atmosphere quickly, if you could do it quickly, it would actually have a pretty fast response. And then it gives you lots of references. So let's um, stop sharing for a moment. And if anyone has, um, it's kind of at the end point here, but if anyone else has a question, wants to raise their hand on Zoom, that's the time to do it. And Stacy, if you saw any interesting questions on the YouTube comments, you can bring them up now because I was not able to track that while I was running the zoom from this side it was but, um the well the one at the beginning was the why um is the darkening earth from ice loss well well the reason earth gets darker from ice loss is that the ice reflects 80 percent of sunlight but ocean water absorbs 80 <laughs> percent so you, you go from reflecting most of the sunlight to absorbing most of the sunlight and that makes the earth darker that is the definition you know, what is yeah, it they, mean? They the albedo just... is is how much the Earth reflects the sunlight away, and if you get rid of the ice and you replace it with dark water, you're going to get or dark land, you're going to get more absorption. Okay, so just a high level summary. If there are those joining near the end for some reason, and Jim James Hansen, one of the world's foremost climate scientists, he's in his 80s now, I believe, and he's still really working hard. Um, you can listen to our interview with him from a few months ago, linked in the description. Um, he's saying that the IPCC, which is saying global warming is a big, big problem, certainly, but he's saying that they they base that mostly on climate models, which are wrong. And in, indeed the world is actually warmer, warming more due to greenhouse gases. And it's also being cooled more by aerosols. And the combination of those things uh, means that we have to work much harder to fight climate change. And we have to take, uh, we have to implement policies much more urgently than is currently happening. So that would be the high level summary. And we'll get one question from Dr. Brian. Oh, I, oh wait, wait, before you do that, I got to let you unmute and I have to let you start your video. So there we go. Okay. So Dr. Brian, go ahead. Is most of the planetary dimming due to uh, marine cloud loss instead of ice loss? Um, well, I think he's saying that, first of all, that, that, that is an important part. He did not also mention the Southern Ocean. Uh, sea ice loss is being important, but only more recently. And so, therefore, you could kind of distinguish it from the marine cloud part of it, because it, that happened earlier. It was like the earth was warming even before the the Antarctic sea ice went away in the last few years. So, um, so I think it's not one or the other, but it's how much. And basically, he's saying that the the ship impact is ten times more than what the IPCC says it is, and can explain. Most of the warming we have seen when you add the the re sort of non-super El Nino on top of it, that explains what we saw in 2023, along with other factors. But I mean, he's not saying it's the only thing, but but a major, a, or I don't know what the right word would be, but a major impact is caused by the shipping changes. The, the thing okay, I'd so like to add is... ...are actually uh, related to marine cloud loss. It's a little bit hard to hear you there, Dr. Brown. Uh, marine cloud loss is uh, related to the shipping. The shipping um, yeah. reduces the marine clouds. Right. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. It does, well, it does two things. The, 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 the sulfur emissions themselves reflect sunlight, but the bigger impact is the fact that those sulf sulfur particles do create clouds, make existing clouds last longer, and make existing clouds brighter. Those three things. So new clouds, longer clouds, brighter clouds, all that together is a huge, huge impact on on global warming yeah eli yeah the, yeah, the thing i'd like to add is is that both are important but uh uh sea ice loss 
and uh, also permafrost loss uh, um, are disproportionately important because uh, uh, we have polar amplification, number one. Um, mm -hmm. Number two, uh, the herd of elephants in the room is methane. And uh, um, we don't even know uh, what the distribution of, of uh, uh, methane clathrates are around uh, Antarctica. It's poorly mapped. We know that there are some. Mm. We know that uh, more F methane is breaking the sea surface at at least one of them. The rate of that has increased uh, over 10 years. Uh, this is, you know, an ill characterized and potentially highly nonlinear feedback. Uh, and, and we don't have a plan. Well, that's like a whole other <laughs> thing. We're, we're not getting into this, but this uncertainty is not your friend, you know. <laughs> Not knowing something isn't like it should not be comforting to you uh, when it comes to any of these things. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for everyone joining us today on Zoom, on Clubhouse and on YouTube Live. Please subscribe and like this program. The more people that like it, the more people that will see it. And it's in a very, very important subject that the world, the press is just really ignoring, which is insane, considering, again, this is not esoteric scientific uh, gobbledygook this is something that will affect your life and the lives of your children in a very direct manner in the in the coming decades and it already is because that's why it was so warm last year so um so thanks everyone for joining us uh if we, we do climate chats every sunday at 10 a.m pacific there's lots of great interviews you can see there's links in the description to take you to those or just look for Climate Chat on YouTube, our channel, and you'll see lots of great programming. And uh, thanks, everyone. We do often interviews. We've been doing like the last five weeks, we had interviews with climate scientists. Uh, this week is an open discussion, which we do once in a while. Probably do another open discussion next week as well. And thanks, everyone, for coming. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dan, Stacy, everyone.